Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I see the crowd is just filtering into the virtual auditorium. Uh, please take your virtual seats as we do another first at this, uh, at this Hit Lab Summit 2021. Um, we are going to host uh, the Breakthrough Alliance pitch competition. Um, normally, uh, this is done as a separate occasion, uh, but uh, what better to make the 2021 summit than to have it uh, pitched live uh, to you, the audience, and to our esteemed judges. Um, uh, first of all, I will uh, hand over to John Hammett, Executive Director of HitLab, to give us a brief overview of the Breakthrough Alliance for those of you who are unfamiliar, and then we'll introduce the judges, and then we'll have the pitch competition uh, with the five uh, different um, innovators pitching their uh, digital health solutions to the judges and you, the audience. Um, and then while the judges go and deliberate um, in a separate meeting, we'll have a wonderful keynote speech given by Deborah Bass of Nubo Cares. Um, and then we will invite the judges back and find out who the winner is. So really, really exciting stuff. So buckle your seatbelts for the next hour and a half. Uh, we are going to have uh, a lot of fun with this. Uh, over to you, John. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, and again, welcome uh, to everyone from uh, at least the, uh, and good, good afternoon from the East Coast of the United States. Uh, we're going to uh, enjoy this program because uh, the, we're celebrating the innovations in healthcare and most importantly, the digitally driven or digitally uh, uh, based innovations in healthcare. Uh, and we're doing this through a fact, flagship program called the Breakthrough Alliance. Uh, the Breakthrough Alliance has actually been operating for the better part of five years. It grew out of a partnership between HitLab and uh, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, where New York City had ambitions to find leading examples of uh, breakthroughs in healthcare and, more importantly, digital breakthroughs in healthcare. And we together found a mechanism whereby we could search for uh, celebrate, select winners, and then help those winners become increasingly successful. And so in a sense, uh, Breakthrough Alliance is all about, you know, finding, celebrating, and uh, acknowledging uh, the breakthroughs, obviously, but more importantly, it's a way of encouraging us to think about what is a breakthrough, and how do we verify the value of breakthroughs, and then how do we find the right resources to help them be successful. Breakthrough Alliance operates uh, as a membership-based uh, consortium. And so we have a number of members uh, in the organization who come from life sciences, from venture capital, from uh, providers and from pay payers and uh, governmental institutions. And they actually form the basis of the framework which allows the breakthrough to catalyze the changes in healthcare and form these innovative partnerships. The benefits uh, are both to the members of the Breakthrough Alliance, as well as most importantly, to the people who go through the process of applying to and being selected as winners of uh, the competition. Uh, it creates a way of fostering connections between the interested members, the venture capitalists, the life science executives, uh, the payers, the providers. Uh, uh, it gives an opportunity for you know, early stage companies to be better known and uh, most importantly, possibly mentored and supported by uh, the members of the Alliance. Uh, through that, they gain access to investment opportunities and partnership. Uh, but then on top of that, HitLab provides the additional uh, verification to help them actually demonstrate the efficacy and the economic foundations of their, uh, you know, of their innovation, uh, depending on where they are in the various stage of maturity. Uh, it adds additional incentive to helping them promote the value of it to the healthcare uh, infrastructure at large. And then through this, we also provide insights both to the members of the organization, as well as through our various uh, briefing documents and case studies that come out of this journey uh, that we can provide to the broader, what I'll call digital health constituency around the world. The winners today actually have uh, some uh, very nice value associated with you know, their participation with and being selected as the finalists. Uh, number one, they do get the rapid efficacy study capabilities delivered through HitLab. 
uh, and we will take the winner and help design a clinical investigation in some form that helps advance their value proposition. Uh, they certainly get the spotlight uh, of being on stage at the conference itself. And we also have a unique uh, added value service within HIT Lab, which we call Connect 360, where uh, based on the efficacy study and based on other characteristics of the early stage company, you know, we're able to connect them with others who could potentially further advance their success as they continue to grow their innovations. The most important thing about this is that the in comparison to other accelerators and incubators of which there are many around the world, HitLab takes no equity and no fees associated with this. Uh, so the program is underwritten by the sponsors uh, and, the and the winners of these competitions actually have no obligation and have no, nothing that they have to provide to be both considered and more importantly, to get the benefits of the Alliance. And so on that basis, Jerry, I'll let you pick up from here and talk a little bit about today's competition. Thank you very much, John, for that, uh, for that intro to Breakthrough. Uh, I think really, really um, you know, uh, much needed if anybody is unfamiliar with the Breakthrough Alliance, a really wonderful initiative uh, by HitLab, um, you know, uh, among the other initiatives that we, that we do run. Um, without further ado, we'd love to introduce the esteemed panel of judges uh, that we have lined up for you today. Uh, so that's Jim, Zena, and Ryan. Uh, I'd love you to introduce yourselves, and we'll start. We'll start with Jim, who is who is first on the call today. So Jim, if you'd like to introduce yourself, um, and then we'll go to Zena and then Ryan. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, hi, I'm Jim McGough. I'm a board member for the Hit Lab Breakthrough Alliance. So very exciting to be a part of this one of the penitential, uh, one of the big events of the year for us. Uh, I uh, am the co-founder of Edge One Medical. We're known as the development partner to eight of the top 20 global pharma for their devices, and including digital health, digital therapeutics, digital biomarkers. Uh, so we work with uh, a lot of the really big players, but we also really, my job as co-founder, I get to work with the early stage guys. And I've done that in MedTech Innovator, NIH, other, other competitions as a judge. Uh, I'm also an angel investor, so excited to be here tonight. I think that's a good overview for me, Jerry. I'll pass it back to you. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Zena. There you go. Classic. Uh, classic. <laughs> so I'm Zena Manji. I'm a regulatory affairs um, lead for innovation, um, senior director at GlaxoSmithKline. Um, I'm in the consumer healthcare division. Um, so my focus is on self-care. And as part of lead for innovation, I work with a lot of startups. Um, in somewhat incubation opportunity for co-development. I also get involved with um, internal development aspects as well. So happy to be here. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Zena. I was trying to find my own mute button. Uh, and uh, over to you, Ryan, last but certainly not least. No, thank you. It's uh, truly a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I've been associated in um, one fashion or another with the HIT Lab for uh, over 20 years now, which is hard to believe. The, the growth is, is remarkable. And in my wildest dreams, I never imagined that I'd have the privilege of being a judge at such a fine event. Uh, tough decisions because there's so many worthy proposals. Uh, in terms of my background, I've been um, uh, in pharma now for about 15 years, mostly medical affairs roles. Currently, I'm consulting for a company called Apellis in Boston. And again, it's a truly a pleasure and privilege to be with you today. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, really, really wonderful to have you all on uh, as judges, and we're honored to have you on, on, this, uh, on this panel. Um, and uh, let's see where I'm going. And uh, what do we have for you today? So we have five different finalists um, who are going to pitch to you today. Um, they came through dozens and dozens of extensive applications from around the world. Um, and uh, uh, Cardiomo, Duality, Telanus, uh, Cake, and Live Metric uh, were all handpicked uh, by the Hit Lab screening team and the Breakthrough Alliance Committee uh, to present to you today um, for this wonderful opportunity to be able to be part of the Breakthrough Alliance. Um, as a reminder, all of our panelists will have, I'm sorry, all of our uh, competitors, all of our finalists will have 10 minutes in total uh, including Q&A to present their digital health solution. Um, 
and uh, and then we will then move on to the next um, finalist until we get to the, uh, the deliberation of the judges. So without further ado, I'd love to uh, welcome um, Cardiomo Care, represented by Ksenia Belkina. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Ksenia, and allow you to share yours. Hi. There you go. Uh, I can. Yeah. So when you're ready, uh, your uh, your ten minutes or so starts whenever you're uh, you're ready to speak, and uh, we're just ahead of schedule, which is wonderful. So uh, please take it away, uh, Ksenia. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me today. I'm Ksenia, co-founder and CEO of Cardiomo. We have developed the most convenient, comfortable, air-based, cutting-edge, highly portable arrhythmia monitoring solution. Um, heart disease remains the world's number one killer, resulting in 18 million deaths a year. There are more than 500 million people globally living with uh, CVD, but the majority of heart uh, disease can be prevented. Just a simple irregular uh, rhythm can lead to heart attacks, strokes, and even sudden cardiac and premature death. We all know uh, atrial fibrillation, a common type of abnormal uh, heart rhythm. It's not a new problem, but it's on the rise and accepted to double. Uh, people with AFib are hospitalized twice as often as people without the condition. Although cardiac arrhythmia cannot be cured completely, uh, the best possible way is continuous cardiac monitoring. A current uh, diagnostic solution on the in the market are inadequate, invasive, um, or uncomfortable. They include virus. There is no possibility to lead a, a normal lifestyle, and we often. Sorry. And we offer uh, the most versatile, accurate, comfortable, and affordable solution that combines uh, uh, an easy to wear, reusable, waterproof, rechargeable, wearable patch uh, that tracks the main vitals. It's very easy to put it on the body, and I will demonstrate, I uh, will show right now. So we take the device from the box. And <clears throat> with the help of electrodes, it has of electrodes, I put it on the body in just a second. So I put it on here and it immediately start to track uh, um, the vital signs, track, track the data. So this is a real time ECG, uh, clinical data, goes to the cloud uh, where our proprietary algorithms provide uh, analysis to detect and diagnose many different kinds of irregular heart rhythm and send real feedback uh, to both patient and clinician. Patient, uh, see, patients see um, just um, user-friendly information in the app like vital data, general health, and motivation notification that supports them uh, in health self-management and has positive effect on the healthcare and health outcomes of people with chronic condition. Clinicians have access to web-based dashboard demonstrating all patients' data analyzed and presented in real time with a function of generating accurate customized report for any period of time to diagnose patient. Uh, Cardiomo primary operates in the cardiac monitoring device market um, that estimated to grow to 22 billion. And the secondary market is the IoT medical device market that is expected to grow to 94 billion. Uh, Cardiomo outperforms existing and emerging solution uh, in the market. We are the only one provides the real-time monitoring with real-time result and alerts can be integrated in any EHR system. Uh, the solution cost-effective, functional, and efficient for medical professionals, uh, patient-friendly and comfortable for patients, and unlike other solution for multiple use. Um, 
uh, cardiomo partners with testing facilities to reach primary care practices and approach hospital directly. We sell uh, devices and annual subscription through direct sales to hospitals and cardiologists. Depending on the service, hospital receive insurance reimbursement by each patient. Physician can use it on multiple patients uh, for the license for the year and charge for each monitoring. Even if average patient has to wait one month a year, physician can use it 12 times over and can charge for that. As we provide variable mobile cardiovascular solution with real-time <clears throat> data analysis, we can use the reimbursement codes for digital health application and telemonitoring in Europe and CPT codes in the United States. Uh, we expand from Netherlands, where we focus now with focus for arrhythmia diagnosis to Germany, UK and US market with new application area. Uh, we launched pilot for cardiac rehabilitation in the US as well as the project of home-based monitoring of pre-operational patients and study in monitoring of post-COVID cardiac patients in Netherlands and Germany. Uh, we have launched uh, the mutual project with medical universities and hospitals in Europe. And uh, also we have signed uh, distribution agreements for uh, countries in Europe. Uh, for, on our way, uh, we have passed clinical already, plus clinical validation and clinical trials. Our company has established a serial manufacturing site Currently, we have launched sales, B2B sales in Europe and generate revenue. Uh, we are making first steps in the US by piloting with hospital in San Francisco for pilots and uh, submitting 510K early next year. According to our financial model, uh, we will be cash positive in 2024. We generate revenue currently, and our financial forecast is based on the demand in the market and feedback from from patients and clinicians. Uh, our team, uh, we are a team of inspiring entrepreneurs, uh, experienced managers, developers, and data scientists. Um, also, we supported by best cardiologists and uh, have strong um, experienced commercial professionals and advisors in our team. Um, our company, uh, backed by Best House Tech Accelerators, University Medical Centers, and grant programs in the United States, Netherlands, and Germany. Uh, with YAM, we also got Best Biometrics Innovation in Healthcare Award. And now, uh, currently, uh, we are looking for 2.5 million. Uh, one 1.5 is already committed. We are using with uh, funds for commercial launch and growing the team, manufacturing, launching pilots in years and preparing FDA. Thank you and use Cardoma to beat heart diseases. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Ksenia, for that wonderful presentation. We're now going to open up to the judges for uh, any questions. Hi, uh, hi. Uh, hi, Christina. Uh, really great presentation. Thank you. Um, quick question. Um, you talked about compare comparison to other options and, and how this is better. Was, was that uh, comparison based on um, clinical evidence or is that based on attributes and usability? Uh, yeah, bo both. Thank you for this question. Yeah, on both. Yeah, uh, we um, mm, I can go to this slide, sl slide and you can see. Yeah, uh, we mentioned we claim the uh, best diagnostic yield. Yeah, uh, because uh, all these um, competitors on this slide, uh, they are not for long term monitoring because a lot of um, mm, a lot of studies based on the diagnostic yield is higher when the uh, monitoring is, then you monitor the patient for, the longer you monitor, monitor the patient, the more uh, accurate diagnostic yield. Yeah, our we claims on this, based on this study and also in lab test, we uh, uh, compare the solution with um, Holter 
as well as uh, in uh, 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 not in the lab, in uh, hospital settings and in home settings, we also uh, compare the uh, device, our device with Holter monitor on patients. So the, the usability uh, for usability. Great presentation. Uh, I just want to ask, you said FDA uh, 510K next year, is that the, the, the plan? Yeah, it's a plan, yeah. Now uh, we um, passed the uh, first uh, uh, stage uh, of CMARC MDR, new regulation. Uh, the second uh, stage uh, audit uh, was scheduled for December 20, so we are very, very close to CMARC MDR. And uh, <laughs> we are very optimistic to have it in uh, uh, maximum March, April next year, but from the beginning of uh, next year, from January, as we already have all documents ready, we start here, yeah, 510K. Uh, okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, we do have maybe just 60 more seconds uh, for one more question. If, if Ryan, you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna come in, or if you don't have any questions left, we will move on to the next presentation. Wonderful presentation. Very clear. No questions. Wonderful offering. Thank you. I had uh, one, one more question. Thanks for demonstrating. Um, that was really, really cool. To see. Um, how, how critical is the placement? And um, if a consumer or a patient is doing it on their own, is there any guidance of I've got it? I've got it on. Yeah, we have very clear uh, guide. Uh, gu uh, quick start guide. So uh, they have free position. So it's very uh, easy to put it on the body because we have free position. One here, one here, and even here. So uh, and if, for example, if the user place it uh, one centimeter uh, right or left, it's uh, no problem. So we, uh, yeah, we made this usability testing and the accuracy of. Uh, mm, data and accuracy of uh, diagnosis not affect this not affect on this parameter. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Ksenia from Cardiomo. Uh, virtual round of applause from everybody. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Susan Perry now from Taylanus uh, to present uh, their virtual, uh, uh, sorry, their digital health solution. Can you see it now? You can see it now, Susan. Go right ahead. Oh, great, great. So as I said, I'm Susan Perry. I'm the CEO of Taylanus, and I'm deeply honored to be speaking with you. The best medicine in the world is only as good as a patient's ability to use it. The question we ask every day is, how are people supposed to follow health instructions that they can't understand? I want to introduce SpeechMed to you. It's our smart device app and platform that removes health literacy obstacles like a user's language preference, age, vision, or literacy level. The foundation of SpeechMed is deeply personal to me because my French mother-in-law Giselle died from a totally avoidable medicine medical mishap due to a language barrier. So imagine that your life depends on taking a bottle pills properly, but neither you nor any family member understands the instructions. That's the challenge that millions of Americans face, around 130 million. According to the National Institute of Adult Health Literacy, 12% of our population has proficient health literacy, and one in five of us goes home to speak a language other than English. And regrettably, at every touch point in healthcare, we're expecting patients to read and read well in English. Um, and we know how that ends up, roughly $600 billion in cost and numerous lives lost. SpeechMed goes beyond traditional um, paper instructions. We've developed an award-winning enterprise system that empowers healthcare providers to give every patient medical instruction in their own language. 
It can it connects to a companion mobile app specifically designed for seniors, the visually impaired, people with low literacy, and the rest of us who want to keep you know, track of our healthcare information in an easy way. One of the things that our application does incredibly well is multilingual medication reminders. And there are currently no other applications that can accurately translate and speak a medication reminder in another language. SpeechMed also translates care instructions, allergies, and other vital health information. If my mother-in-law had gone home with our voice and language platform, she could have listened to her discharge instructions in French and avoided the confusion that led to her medication mishap completely. And because it's powered by voice, elderly and visually impaired patients don't have to rely on paper, paper instructions and they can navigate and hear their own care instructions and medication reminders out loud. We also have a secure leave a message feature that allows patients to tape instructions from health professionals to listen to later by themselves or with family members. So which is easier to understand? The speech med, we can send a simple reminder to tell the patient when and how to take their medication. And we'll also send an alert to caregivers if the patient skips the medication. Millions of us help our loved ones and this feature allows a caregiver to remotely monitor medication compliance and assist a loved one from a distance, which right now is especially important when we're all separated due to a global pandemic. When an emergency occurs, the only thing we think about is getting to the nearest ER. We don't think about our medication list, our allergies, last surgery, any of that all things that they ask when we're admitted to the hospital. Especially during these pandemic times, we never know when the next emergency might happen for us or for our family or where we'll be. We want people to be prepared and provide document storage on SpeechMed to always have access to your health history. You can also pull up your COVID vaccination card with two clicks. It stores family members, caregiver, health insurance, and other important contact information for easily, you know, accessibility in one place. Our market is growing with our aging and immigrant populations. We use an affordable subscription business model for our enterprise and in our consumer applications. One example of the work we're doing is a paid pilot with Baptist Health Neuroscience Institute. The study is evaluating how audio instructions and explainer videos and language can decrease hospital readmissions and increase medical compliance for stroke patients and their caregivers. With an enterprise platform in place and a consumer app that just launched, we're targeting elderly people, multilingual families, caregivers, and key players in home health pharmaceuticals and insurance, and are projecting almost $33 million in revenue in the next three years. We're evolving and including more features as different healthcare stakeholders are applying speech med. We'll include, include more languages. We'll release a companion app called speech med duo in the next few months, which has enhanced features solely for caregivers and family members to monitor their loved ones. We're breaking a language barrier and becoming a tool to enable clinical studies to also include diverse populations. Improving health literacy for patients through technology is important for our team. We are each multilingual, multicultural, and multi-generational caregivers and understand firsthand the financial and emotional responsibilities of giving our loved ones their best days while preserving resources for future generations. Our team started on this journey in hospitality with the first audio digital restaurant menu in the world before we moved to healthcare after Giselle's death. And we're the experts in the space. That's why we wanna make care directions accessible to everyone, especially those that are frequently ignored and left behind. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, Susan. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation. I'm going to open up now to the judges, and I believe, Zina, uh, you have a question for Susan. 
Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, really applaud the efforts on health literacy, just really, really important area. A um, couple questions. One on how do you validate that the information, whether visual or audio, is, is correct? Um, so that was one question. And, and related to that, then how do you keep it updated with, with changes that, that come along in the life cycle of, of treatments? Okay, so in the case of an enterprise system, we are pulling information from the EHR, a lot of times a discharge, but also, you know, doctors and nurses may be modifying the information and it goes to the mobile app in real time. Um, the reason we can validate things like medication reminders is because we've used AI to build scripting algorithms. That's why it takes us quite a while to add a language because we expect 100% accuracy in that area. Some of our other like on the fly translations may be a little bit less, but um, we really, we understand voice and language so well because we've been working on it for 10 years. And we made, you know, our errors while we were in hospitality. So <laughs> we can work very carefully in healthcare. It's important, so important. We have 18 million linguistically isolated children in the United States. It's a big problem. Yeah. So Susan, uh, great presentation, this is Jim. I just curious like on labeling and, and the issues, I mean, FDA is so strict on labeling and, and is there a risk of, you know, someone misinterpreting or a mistranslation that could lead to a, you know, bad outcome for a patient? Um, we've been, you know, rigorously testing this um, with the hospitals, and we go through a very intense um, process with our, you know, building AI um, data to make sure that um, things are labeled properly and that they're read out properly. It really is kind of a total patient engagement application because like at, in, at Baptist Hospital, it follows the patient from the time they enter the hospital till 90 days after they've been discharged, at which time most of our patients continue the service. Wonderful. Um, we have about 90 seconds left for one more question. If, uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, Ryan, otherwise there is a question from the gallery. No, I didn't have any questions. I mean, it's an extraordinarily worthy endeavor uh, to target a population that's been, uh, you know, traditionally uh, uh, overlooked, uh, you know, very, very worthy. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, there is one question from the, from the gallery, Susan. Uh, I think we have time to quickly answer it. Uh, and the question is, with Siri and Google being used in healthcare, how do you plan to outcompete them? With, beg your pardon? Uh, with, with Siri and Google being used. Oh. In, uh, <laughs> okay. how do you, how do so you plan? We've actually had conversations with Google where they said it would be cheaper to buy us than build us. Um, we don't rely on, we love Google. And in fact, we use their translation sometimes for on the fly things. But the reality is you cannot accurately translate things like medication with standard um, translation applications, it's dangerous. You have to have 100% accuracy. So that's how we compete. We're, you know, we've, we've been doing it a long time. We know where the pitfalls are and um, we have tons of experience. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation, Susan. Um, you. And uh, you know, congratulate you on your efforts. And we're now going to move on to, um, Cake presented by uh, Su Lin Chen. Uh, so I'm going to make you a co-host, Su Lin, so you can share your screen. Um, and when you're ready, you can uh, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, we can see it just fine. Wonderful. Let me just actually, can you still see? I'm just going to move it so I can see it better. Still good? Uh, yeah, looks good. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for having me. I love being in a healthcare audience because I know that so many people here are here because they really care about people and want to help people. And so I wanted to bring up a concept that our team thinks about a lot, 
which is that people have priorities in their lives beyond just living as long as possible. This is paraphrased from Atal Gawande and is actually based on multiple studies with seriously ill patients and what they care about. And so my thinking is what is restraining us as healthcare professionals from having more conversations about what's important to people and their values and goals in life? And so one of the issues is what I sometimes call the elephant in the room in healthcare. And that elephant is death. That is a hard topic for a lot of us to think about. And that's where CAKE comes in. My name is Sulin Chen. I'm the CEO of CAKE. We're the leading technology platform that helps people navigate everything from end of life planning and advanced care planning all the way through to what to do after loss. And this is incredibly important. Every single human being in the world has to think about this and address this, not just for themselves, but for everyone they care about. And when you don't address it, it can lead to a lot of avoidable pain. People can get care that's inappropriate or wasteful or causes more suffering. People can lose money. Families can get torn apart. We see these things a lot. And that's why we have built our comprehensive solution here at CAKE. We want to help people live fully and die well. And we do this by not just addressing healthcare alone, because we want to address the full whole person. And so many of these things are interconnected. So we help people think about healthcare preferences, but we also help with financial considerations, legal documents, how they would want their funeral or memorial to be, how they want to be remembered, and of course, our digital lives that have become so rich. These are all important and people want all of this in one place. And we've grown a lot. Um, we've actually doubled in the last six months and we're now serving 40 million people a year. So they come to CAKE to use our planning tools as well as to help cope with loss and bereavement and grief and figuring out all the things they need to do there. And then we have a comprehensive suite of products that also help with sharing that information. So making sure that the people who need to know this information have that information. We also have an extensive library of content and resources of 35 articles written by our experts. So we help people navigate all of this. And of course, with 40 million people a year, you can imagine that we have a ton of data and we have more data than anybody else. So we use that data to build proprietary data models to create a very personalized user experience for people. We wanna meet people where they are and everyone's life situation is different. And so we always like to say that it's really not one size fits all. And we wanna make sure that everyone has the best user journey that's applicable to what they're going through. And this came in a really good time. People have been interested in end of life for a long time, but it's really been accelerated by this pandemic. This is really top of mind for people and consumer motivation to engage with this subject has really gone up and the stigma has gone down. People understand why this is important to talk about and to think about and to plan for. And so we have consumer tools and we also build enterprise tools for enterprise clients. Over the last years, we've been reached out to by multiple health systems, insurance companies, and financial services companies to build end of life solutions for their audiences. They know this is important, but they don't really know how to engage their audiences with this topic. And they have multiple goals when they wanna do this. They wanna add more value to their customers. They wanna retain them better. They wanna differentiate and attract new customers. They wanna raise awareness of other products and services that they have. And they just wanna better understand this space. Um, so we create data dashboards for our clients so they can kind of see where engagement is and start to segment people by things like age, demographic, demographics, asset level, health, and things like that. Um, so, sorry. yeah, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I, I don't know if you're moving your slides, but uh, we do see your screen, but your slides are moving. Uh, I didn't know you were moving slides. Oh, um, are you on slide eight? Uh, no, we're on slide one. Oh, that's so strange. Fair. Can I stop sharing for a second? Of course can you can. share? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, uh, I should have picked that up earlier, but um, I didn't realize you were switching your slides. I'm sorry. 
Oh yeah, no worries. Um, let me think about this. Maybe I should go back. So maybe you will all see some of my slides. Cool. Um, so essentially, so that you, you've all just seen this one slide? Uh, yes. Okay, okay, no worries. So basically I was just talking about what we do and why this is so important. Um, and that we have a comprehensive solution around many different topics. And then uh, here is a illustration of some of the products that we have around pre-planning and going into coping with loss. And then the fact that uh, this is not a one size fits all problem and that we have a lot of data to address it. And then I was just talking about how the pandemic has shifted the landscape and created a lot more urgency amongst consumers around why this is important to do. And, and then here, uh, this is what the slide that I, I think we were on. Um, so I was just talking about how we have consumer facing tools as well as a whole host of enterprise tools and a lot of different types of customers in all of these different spaces. Um, so I'm gonna move ahead and do you all see slide nine? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Um, so great. So what I was going to do was going to go through two examples of case studies that we've done with different clients. So in this first case study, one of the US's largest health systems reached out to us because they wanted to do better in this space. They wanted to increase the number of advanced directives in their EHR. And so they had looked at multiple vendors and they chose Cake because they said we had the best user experience. It was very important to them that it was simple and easy to use. So we built a co-branded digital workflow for advanced care planning. They knew that in order to hit their goal of increasing advanced directives, they needed a self-serve digital solution. And right out the gate without any optimization, we actually increased advanced care planning engagement by sixfold. And so there's multiple benefits to the provider here. They have better access to advanced care planning tools and ultimately more personalization and better equity around this topic. We have a lot of data so we can see where people are getting stuck and start to optimize the user journeys. We are very capable of implementing very quickly and scaling to millions and millions of patients. And then to the patient, of course, we provide a self-serve modern user-friendly workflow for them to actually be empowered to say what their preferences and values are and ensure their care is aligned. So the second case study I'll share is from a Fortune 500 insurance company who reached out to us because they saw, they had identified end of life as a consumer trend that they didn't wanna miss out on. And so they wanted to improve retention and satisfaction and also let their audience know about other products and services they have. So already out the gate, we just went live here, we're seeing a referral rate of 40% to other products and services in their portfolio, which is a massive amount. And so some of the benefits that they're looking for are to differentiate and reduce churn, to really show that they care about their audience. We've seen from multiple, all of our rollouts that when an organization offers cake, people feel more positively about that organization. They also wanted to better understand how people are behaving in this space and start to cultivate relationships, not just with their core customer, but with the family members and other people surrounding that person. And of course, the benefits to the consumer is that they get so much more guidance on this really important subject that is top of mind for them. So at Cake, we won multiple awards for our work, and I'd love to talk to anyone here who's interested in offering more end-of-life planning support to your audience. So I'm happy to take questions, and uh, sorry about the slides not advancing. Uh, no, not at all, Celia, and I apologize I didn't catch that sooner. Um, I hopefully didn't throw you off too, too much. We'll give you an extra minute. Oh, yeah, minute. no worries. We'll give you an extra minute or two to answer some questions from the judges. Sure. I had a question. Um, thank you, Suleen. Uh, such a meaningful topic. You're right, just doesn't get enough attention. Um, and, and I like the comprehend, comprehensive support um, and personalized aspect. How, how do, and you may have covered this, but how do people are, become aware of, uh, how are you reaching consumers and um, uh, you care, caregivers uh, on these tools? Sure. 
Yeah. So the primary way, 90, more than 95% of the way that people are finding us on the consumer side is through search. So we have a very comprehensive SEO program. We're probably one of the best in the world. And so we've, uh, people come to us organically through Google mostly. And then through our enterprise uh, clients, it's a B2B to C. So they'll receive an email from their health system or from their bank or from their insurance company. Sorry guys, I'm in a noisy background here, but real quick, no great presentation, Susan. I just saw the, how are people paying? Are you mostly, is it free and you have other kind of services that you uh, upcharge for or? I've seen different models if you're going through the B2C first and then you're going to add enterprise later. So can you tell us how that's working for you? Yeah, sure. So today the majority of our revenue comes in through our enterprise clients. So we're standing up custom solutions for them. And sometimes there's integrations. Um, we can white label or co-brand. Then on the direct-to-consumer side, most of our revenue from the direct-to-consumer side comes from affiliate relationships. So for example, at Turnova, they turn ashes into diamonds. Um, we can kind of match make there and then get a referral fee. And then we also have premium services that we're testing out and uh, we'll be rolling out more over the next year or so. Uh, wonderful. Anything else from you, Brian, uh, before we move on? Yeah, no, I, I used to take care of an ICU for a few years, and I don't think I ever had a patient tell me that they wanted to die in the ICU, but that unfortunately is where it all too often happens. Uh, I think this continues to be a long neglected but much overdue, you know, area of focus, and I sort of applaud your efforts. Uh, apologize for my congestion. I'm getting over a, a booster shot reaction, so... Uh, um, wish me luck <laughs> thank you very much ryan and thank you very much sulin for uh, for that excellent presentation uh, i apologize uh, that the slides weren't working oh yeah no worries um but a real a real excellent recovery from you uh, and i'd like and with that i'd like to invite uh, kelly uh, benning from live metric uh, to please take the stage okay thank you no, um, no, no worries, no worries. Some something else was showing up for um okay anyways Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Kelly Benning. I'm a vice president with Live Metric. Uh, John and Jerry, thank you so much for the introduction. I am excited to be here um, amongst this incredible crowd of companies. Um, Jim, Zena, and Ryan, nice to meet you. I think you have a very tough decision ahead of you. I hope all the companies can win. <laughs> um, am I allowed to say that? I guess we can't all win, but um, they are all are worthy. So incredible presentations today. Um, we have uh, the world's first wearable monitor for continuous blood pressure monitoring. And so I'm going to be sharing with you today some um, information about our continuous monitor. So as you may be aware, hypertension is the largest epidemic known to mankind. And to think that the blood pressure cuff has been around for 120 years and we're still seeing hypertension and cardiovascular disease at an all time high. One in three deaths is attributed to cardiovascular disease. Almost one in two Americans have hypertension and 75% of those people are uncontrolled. And it is costing um, an exorbitant amount of money to our healthcare system. Physicians and payers have traditionally been operating in the dark. They just don't have the data that they need to make really important decisions about patient's health, especially related to hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Less than 10% of the patients who are prescribed to use their blood pressure cuff at home do so. So uh, upon multiple conversations with cardiologists, hypertension specialists, um, for their patients who even have severe cardiovascular disease like CHF and COPD, they still do not bring in their data. And it's uncomfortable to wear a cuff. It can be painful because it can pinch. Patients don't like manually recording their data and they don't like having to stop their action and sit down and do it. So it's just something that um, has been a struggle for providers and payers for a long time. And so we took those things into, into account when we developed Live Metric. So Live Metric is the world's first nanosensor based passive wearable technology, and we hope to improve and will improve outcomes globally by providing the first time continuous, most accurate blood pressure readings at a low cost. What's really unique about Live Metric is that for the first time ever, patients can wear their monitor at night and they can sleep through it 
So doctors and physicians and patients are going to have access to nocturnal data, which has never been available before. Um, if a patient wears a cuff at night, it typically wakes them up. And so you're not getting a true nocturnal blood pressure. We're also able to give continuous feedback. So looking at did you eat a high salt lunch or did you exercise today? How are those things impacting your blood pressure in real time so that patients can begin to understand how their behavior and lifestyle impacts their blood pressure and cardiovascular disease? We are the only monitor that's also correlated to the arterial line. So the arterial line is used in the ICU and it is an invasive line that measures beat by beat blood pressure. We decided to do our validation studies and correlate ourselves to the arterial line because it is the most accurate way to monitor blood pressure. And we also um, sample continuous pressure waveforms at 100 Hertz, which means we have a very high quality signal. This is an idea about how live metric can be used. And while a patient is sleeping or during the daytime while they're working or doing these types of activities, they can wear their band and they have access to an app in which in that app, they can see their real-time results. They can see their trend analysis and receive reporting that helps them monitor their disease state. And then that data can also be shared out of the app with friends and family, or it can go to a provider portal. If that avenue wants to be changed as well for the provider to receive the data, we can connect to EMR so that the data is put into that patient's record and the doctor has real-time access to that patient's um, data as well. This allows doctors to obviously optimize therapy. And probably one of the most important pieces is that they're able to optimize medication efficacy. Right now, it takes six to nine months to change medications for hypertensive patients because of the lack of data. We anticipate doctors will be able to change medications or um, move medication dosage up and down um, in days time versus months with live metric. This is uh, our FDA 510K and CE mark validation study. So we followed the ISO uh, protocol and found that um, our standard of error in both systolic and diastolic was almost um, twice as good of that of the cuff. And we weren't surprised by that since we did uh, correlate and use the arterial line in our studies, we expect it to be the most accurate monitor, uh, monitoring service or platform available. We currently have our CE mark in Europe and expect FDA in the next couple of months as we're about two years into our application process with them. A couple quick highlights as we get into live metric. So um, as I mentioned before, it's the first wearable continuous beat to beat blood pressure monitor highly correlated to the arterial line. And our unique value proposition is that at the onset of a condition, you can use live metric to begin to monitor and determine how the outcomes will be for that patient, as well as provide data in time to help. So we're looking at the ability to be able to recognize um, different cardiovascular conditions, potentially AFib and other um, disease states that might be associated with your blood pressure. We know that scalability is going to be uh, massive because as I mentioned before, one in two Americans um, has high blood pressure and 75% are uncontrolled. Um, we also have reason to believe that scalability will be fast because there's new CPT codes for reimbursement, as well as new um, guidelines from the AMA and AHA that say patients should be monitoring their blood pressure at home and should no longer be relying on their blood pressure measurements done in office. Um, we have target markets for both SAS and DAS um, revenue models, and we'll be catering to uh, retail, payers, providers, and pharma. So I'll get a little bit more into all of these things, but I um, wanted to just share an overview or some highlights about live metric. This is also um, something that is very unique to live metric because we collect the full pressure waveform at 100 Hertz. We're the only monitor that will be able to do this. You won't be able to do this with a PPG sensor like you see on an Apple watch and you won't be able to do this with a cuff. What we're able to do is with this pressure waveform, be able to identify things like masked sleep hypertension, morning surge, which is a, a indicator of cardiovascular disease, 
And then very exciting, over one heartbeat, we can tell the efficacy of a beta blocker on a patient's blood pressure. So we know that this has implications for doctors and providers to be able to understand how that medication is working for that patient's cardiovascular disease or hypertension, and also has great indications for pharmaceutical companies who are looking at the right time to administer their drug or what type of patient their drug is more, most efficacious for. We're also looking at right now, we're conducting clinical trials at Columbia, um, potentially Mayo coming up and University of Chicago, where we're looking at the ability to detect 20 additional cardiovascular conditions. So you'll see here through the full pressure waveform, we can see things like valvular impairment or regurgitation. Um, and we can also see left ventricular systolic impairment. So we're in clinical trials right now to identify the algorithms that will help patients and providers be able to identify these conditions or the risk of these conditions, excuse me, so that they can receive further testing to verify them. Um, what's really cool about this is that all of these conditions were only um, diagnosed when somebody came in, they complained of symptoms, the doctor went ahead and, and ran additional tests. Now with live metric, you have the ability to identify the risk of these conditions, get the patient in the office so that they can continue further testing to, um, to see if in fact they do have these conditions. These are our verticals for rapid growth. Um, we are working with Medicare Advantage and employer plans. We are also going to be distributed at Walgreens, Best Buy, and other major retail outlets, very similar to how other blood pressure cuffs are currently um, on the marketplace. This allows um, a member of a healthcare plan to go in and purchase their device or a consumer. And then we are also working with hospitals, nursing homes, and long-term care facilities through partner ecosystems. We expect rapid scaling through healthcare consumption. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be offered at major retail outlets, and we are going to be um, distributed by Home Medics, who's the second largest distributor of blood pressure cuffs in North America. Um, after careful review, they decided to also become an investor in Live Metric. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And they'll also be distributing us at Boots in Europe and other major um, pharmaceutical outlets there. We had a Series A investment that was um, funded by Home Medics, um, a fund called Amen, and some private family offices, as well as our co founders, um, just to give you. Um, a bit of information about how the company was started. We have signed contracts right now with ProHealth and Aurora Advocate. So even prior to FDA, we're seeing a huge amount of excitement. People are willing to go through the IRB because they want to have our device. Um, ProHealth is going to be using it for their own employees who happen to be doctors and nurses with uncontrolled hypertension. And then at Aurora Advocate, they're going to be giving it to um, patients who show up to the emergency department with a hypertensive urgency so they can go home with the device. Um, we have signed contracts with home medics and then um, obviously have and are growing a great pipeline right now, both in the US and Europe. Adoption is going to be driven in the U.S. by new CPT codes. I won't spend much time here except to say that new CPT codes are big on self-measured blood pressure. So being able to take that blood pressure at home versus in the office has become an AMA and AHA um, initiative. We have a very strong leadership team. Um, Tomer, who is our CEO, comes from the nanosensor world and wanted and had a passion for bringing nanosensors to healthcare to um, really bring a higher level of technology into healthcare. Um, and I'll let you read about the rest. We also have um, a team of great advisors. Um, one of them, Professor George Backris, who is a part of a handful of um, hypertension specialists in the world, and Professor Nair Uriel, who is a transplant and CHF specialist. Um, these are some quotes from them, so I can let you read over those, and I'll stop there because I think I'm probably close to my 10-minute um, timing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's wonderful, Kelly. Uh, thank you for giving me such a thorough presentation. Uh, there's a good couple of questions actually coming in from everywhere. Unfortunately, you only have time for one, okay. uh, and that's, uh, that's going to come from Zena. Uh, so, Zena? Hi, Zena. Hey, Kelly. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Um, very comprehensive. I did have a question about the um, continuous aspect and, and the, um, how you're managing the registration um, from a continuous monitoring um, aspect. 
So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that um, as if it's based on a continuous AI aspect or how do you then uh, manage feedback or or updates that need to be occur uh, that need to occur? Um, sure. Um, has that have you discussed that with regulators and and I assume the CE mark is through MDR? Uh, I'm I'll answer that one briefly. I apologize. I don't know the answer to your CE mark question, but I can get back to you on that. Um, regarding your other questions, when we say continuous, so it can be approximately every one to ten heartbeats, especially for like a hospital at home program or patients who are who are very ill at home, versus another user who might only want it once every five minutes or ten minutes, um, and we're averaging averaging that over time. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but we're also the only device on the market that does not require calibration. And we don't require calibration because we're based on an AI model that takes into account um, gender, weight, height, um, et cetera. So once a patient puts those puts that data in, then every single reading is ran through an AI model and the insured accuracy is there behind that. Um, so the no calibration obviously is huge. What we do anticipate is that well, people will have to charge their band and there will be some time either when they're charging or post charging where an update can occur. So there will be um, times when it won't be truly continuous as the updates and the charging need to occur. Does that answer your question, Zena? Okay, okay, great. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly, for uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you, Zina, for fulfilling the question. I will now um, welcome Kelly. Um, I'm sorry, no, Kelly's going. Rina Sh uh, Shainsky uh, from uh, Duality. Uh, please uh, take the stage and uh, we welcome you to um, share your presentation. Thank you. And uh, thanks for choosing Duality to present. Uh, and can you hear me okay? Everybody can hear me? We can hear you just fine, yes. Great. Um, so uh, Duality is um, enabling secure data collaborations in the healthcare. And I am a co-founder and chairwoman of Duality. Um, so we are a bit different in a way because we address the need for ecosystems in healthcare um, and in other regulated industries to collaborate on their sensitive data. So in this data-driven environment, um, to extract value from data, you need to enable organizations to enrich the data, to analyze it, to collaborate on it, and to use the cloud. And in healthcare, uh, a lot of data is very sensitive, but the organizations have to collaborate. This is a very uh, complex ecosystem of uh, pharma and medical centers and payers and insurers. And there is a strong need to collaborate on data, but there are many barriers to this. And um, some of it is already possible, but then there are some very sensitive data sets which uh, are very difficult to collaborate on because of uh, barriers such as privacy, security, regulation, and also business challenges because uh, medical centers often treat their data and justifiably so because it takes a long time to curate it and, um, um, uh, and uh, actually they uh, accumulate it for a long time from the patients and so on. So they treat it as a very valuable asset and they would like to remain in control when it's being shared and used. And today this is very, very difficult. And in fact, with the data privacy regulations, the barriers are only becoming uh, more difficult and cross-border data sharing is even more complex than ever before. So Duality was uh, founded by world-renowned uh, crypt cryptography uh, experts, including a Turing Award winner, Professor Shafi Goldwasser uh, from MIT and Berkeley, and data science experts. And what we are doing, we are putting together these two complex disciplines of cryptography and data science 
to enable organizations to collaborate on sensitive data without exposing it. And we make it a, this way possible to really do collaborative analytics on very sensitive data, such as patients' data, and even to link data sets and to identify a, um, whether there are joint patients without disclosing their identities and uh, to um, aggregate data from uh, basically to increase the cohort sizes in order to derive meaningful information, which is very important, of course, in order to know real world data, real world evidence, uh, efficacy of treatments. So one needs to get to gain a critical mass of data. But this is, uh, as I mentioned, is very complex and anybody who tries to do it in the healthcare ecosystem, I'm sure experienced the difficulty. And this is exactly the problem that duality is addressing by combining advanced form of encryption called homomorphic encryption with data science and uh, enabling collaboration on data while it remains encrypted at all times. And you can see here the duality was selected by the World Economic Forum as a technology a pioneer and by Gartner as a cool vendor in this new discipline of privacy, a pre, a protected um, analytics. A, and we are collaborating with a, um, major medical centers, which I, I will show in a second. Um, so the use cases that we have already shown and validated uh, our technology have to do with uh, cancer research in healthcare, and we enable leading medical institutions to collaborate on their sensitive data to extract valuable insights. So one case study that I wanted to share here is a study that we performed with Tel Aviv Medical Center on uh, basically patients' data, uh, oncological patients. And we have shown that performing analytics, which is um, they usually do on the um, oncological patients, while the data is encrypted, yields exact and accurate results while the data remains encrypted during the analytics. So that opens the door, unlocks the way for organizations to collaborate, uh, something that they have a great difficulty to do uh, because they want to remain in control of how their data is used. And um, specifically in Israel, we are now um, in the process of enabling um, several uh, oncological centers to collaborate on their data. Another case study that we, uh, in a, uh, one more comment, we published this uh, study at recent ASCO. The abstract was published and you're very welcome to look at this with all the details. And another case study, which is very interesting, we published in PNAS, and this is on uh, basically performing GWAS, genome-wide association study on the uh, genomic variants while they are encrypted with this advanced form of encryption. And we showed that this is possible and practical. And we did it in collaboration with the leading bioinformatician from Dana-Farber and Harvard Medical School. So all these uh, case studies basically prove that uh, organizations can collaborate now on their data and remain in control of how the data is being used and basically share only results of these combined computations. And they don't need to expose or lose control of the data that they have accumulated. And this opens the door of a um, collaborating in the area such as, uh, the reason oncology is so relevant here because no single medical center with precision medicine becoming more and more uh, prevalent have critical mass of patients 
to look at the, for example, efficacy of a new drug that was just released or comparing various treatments. And if you can combine patients' information from several medical centers, one can uh, derive a much more robust statistical results. And uh, up until now, this was a, a very, very complex process. And uh, often organizations had to trust an intermediary and basically to submit their data to a third party in a uncontrolled form. What we have shown that it is possible in a way to eat the cake and have it, to share data, to enjoy the results of analysis uh, while keeping control uh, of the data itself and while protecting privacy of the patients. So duality enables a variety of use cases of uh, using sensitive data, collaborating on sensitive data. There is a lot of relevancy to real world evidence studies, to running machine learning models on the cloud, on sensitive data, linking genomic data with medical records and uh, performing analytics on this combined data sets. So there are many, many uh, use cases specifically for the healthcare ecosystem. We really now make it available for any organizations that would like to collaborate um, and remain in control of their data and to share the results. And during the pandemic, we all witnessed the challenge of a, um, pri a um, personal privacy versus public health because people want to remain in control of their public data. And yet a, a health organizations would like to analyze the trends of how the disease is being spread. And that creates a lot of conflict. So with this technology, one can enable collaborating on sensitive data. And the, the markets being impacted by our technology are very large, not only in healthcare, um, but specifically in healthcare, it's also very, very large markets because cloud transition is a very big mega trend. Data protection, we're all aware of how important it is. And of course, applying data science and the building models on sensitive data is also a very large market. So basically duality enables and protects entire data ecosystems. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Rina. Thank you very much for uh, that, that excellent presentation. Uh, we have time for just one quick question as uh, I know we have run a little bit behind you some technical difficulty. Uh, so I'm gonna open up to one question from the judges uh, and then we're going to have them deliberate uh, while we have our keynote. Um, so I had one question, Rena. Thank you so much. How how are you? Um, what what are your thoughts on the the privacy aspects and data stewardship? Um, it's such a challenge now with with Europe and and U.S. and, and transaction of data. It, it's it's evolving. Um, but what what are your thoughts on how you're managing? That's that exactly. Sorry. Yeah. That's exactly where we can be very very helpful. And you're right, cross-border is a huge challenge. And in EU, even between countries, and also even more so between EU and US. So the getting data from Europe and analyzing it in, in the US is a major barrier. And with our technology, it is feasible because the data remains encrypted at the time of analysis. Uh, wonderful. No, that's, uh, that's really fantastic, uh, Rina. Thank you for coming on and sharing that with us. Um, at this juncture, uh, I'd like to uh, invite the judges uh, to retire to the other um, uh, video conference room um, with Stan Kuchnowski, who will, uh, who will moderate uh, your judging session. Uh, thank you very much again, Rina. I'm just going to change your role here. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Deborah Bass, going to uh, deliver our keynote um, speech. Uh, Hi, Jerry. Are you able to hear me and see my slides? I can, yep. Okay, so 
Good afternoon, good evening. I'm privileged to be able to share some of the insights from my collective experience. So by way of background, I'm, I'm Deborah. I'm currently the US President Chief Marketing Officer of Nuvo Group, which has very novel and recently FDA cleared technology for remote pregnancy monitoring. Prior to Nuvo, I spent my career at multinational corporations with a red thread in consumer-driven healthcare. So I started my career way back when at Procter & Gamble, got traditional general management, brand management experience, and then segued into a journey in healthcare with time at Bristol-Myers Squibb and the last 15 years at Johnson & Johnson companies in a variety of commercial capacities in both the consumer and med device divisions. So I talk to you today with insights from my collective experience and a perspective I've created around the importance of bringing together both big co and new co to really incubate the next generation of innovations and impact. So three big lessons learned I'll share. The first one is about creating a leadership mashup. So what do I mean by that? When we look at fielding a team for a startup, there's often a dynamic tension between people like myself that originated from big companies and come from a place of resource and expertise and rigorous approaches of how to do things versus a world of startups, right? Where they're dreamers and visionaries. And how do we harness this dynamic tension to really ensure there's a culture and a place of leadership that embraces both freedom to invent, experiment, discover, and rigor. And, and part of what to think about when you're looking at fielding this team or, or mashup of different types of leadership is where you are in the journey. So how mature is the category you're in? Is this space travel for leisure? You know, which is just being formed by really far out visionaries? Or is this another chronic care digital health play, which perhaps is more ready for prime time in 2021? What stage is your company at? Is this very early stage? And if it's early stage, is this really about the founder and the engineers or inventors? Or are you at a commercial stage where you need to balance that leadership team with not only the inventors, but also people that bring in different functional leadership and discipline. So what are the right experiences and, and skill sets to have on the bus and at what time? My point of view is we really need to embrace again, a mashup of big co expertise and discipline and startup agility. So one example, just to start making it real, is regulatory. Where, where are you in terms of the regulatory pathway? Do you want to go through a regulatory pathway where you're going to get a CE mark or FDA clearance? And what clinical studies might be involved? And which pathway might you want to take? And how do you navigate the FDA? If you're going to go through a regulatory pathway, you wanna make sure you have the right experts on the team. Another example might be where I, the world I come from of, of brand building. Do you want to develop a brand that's relevant to providers and patients? And how do you think about brands and bringing that discipline in at an early stage? And my second lesson will lean into that theme a little bit more fully. The other consideration as you build your leadership team and really think about phases of the company, and again, having the right types of leaders at the right time, are a tolerance for failure versus milestone achievement. And one thing my founder tells me all the time is in earlier stages of the company, there was much more freedom to fail and permission to fail because that's how we learn, right? By what doesn't work and failing forward. But as we hit a commercial stage, our investors and customers and stakeholders 
expect us to be much more predictable in hitting our milestones and keeping our promises. So again, something to think about as you mix up the talent and, and you fuse dreamers with operators, right? Dreamers that keep the dream and what's possible alive and operators that really tie down what's needed to deliver your milestones. So first lesson again is about this leadership mashup and really from my perspective, fusing the right skills and mindsets from both big companies as well as startups. And, and as we saw through the startups that just presented, that could be on your management or leadership team, but also in how you construct your board of directors and advisory councils. My second big lesson is about building purpose-driven brands out of the gate. And this is really about thinking beyond a functional benefit or a category benefit and playing for something bigger. And this is relevant whether you are going after a brand like Johnson's Baby that has over a hundred year legacy in the market and you need to keep it fresh or relevant to your consumers, or if you're creating an entirely new brand like we did with Nuvo. And let me give you three examples of purpose-driven brands from my own experience and how we thought about that. So the first one comes from the space of orthopedics and the company called Depew, which is now Depew Synthes at Johnson & Johnson, if any of you are familiar with that company. So when I was at Depew, this was around 2007, 2008, we wanted to reframe what category we played in and really create differentiation and bigger meeting in what we saw as a valley of metal implants. And we decided to take a bold stance and a movement to restore, retain, and improve movement and really not stop until everyone is moving, really going from a metal company to a movement company. And our higher calling and purpose was to ensure that everyone had the ability to never stop moving, to live their fullest life and livelihood. And to bring to, get, bring to life this idea, we brought in the persona of Coach K from Duke, and I'm not sure if the international audiences are as familiar with Coach K, but he's been the longstanding coach of Duke University, which has a top NCAA, NCAA basketball team. He also coached the US Olympic Dream Team. But what you probably don't know about Coach K is that he has two Depew hips and he almost retired from basketball until he got his joint replacements. So first case was Depew, reframing from a metal company to a movement company behind a higher purpose of never stop moving. A second one is a purpose-driven brand of Johnson's Baby, which many of you may remember from your childhood or raising your children or nieces and nephews today. And with Johnson's, this is a brand that had lost relevance with a new generation of consumers because we spent too much time in the do no harm space with talking about all the things we didn't do, like no more tears or no more tangles. And there was an opportunity to take a more active point of view and do good. And we created this higher purpose and, and brand idea of so much more than a bath or this idea of so much more. And really what so much more is about is taking these daily rituals of bath time and bedtime and diapering and really making them moments for bonding and personal connection and sensorial enrichment toward healthier baby development. So again, another example of pivoting from more functional benefits of cleaning and toiletries to doing so much more for the health and wellness of your baby. And then my third example of a person of a purpose-driven brand is Nuvo from my current experience. 
And again, we're currently in the remote pregnancy monitoring business, but from our outset, we've taken a broader view and a bold ambition to give life a better beginning. And that's no, not only about having the right monitoring and adherence to prescribed care in prenatal monitoring, but also how we plan to use our data to inform new care pathways and ensure that every mom and every baby will have their best start in life. So again, second lesson is about purpose-driven brands. And I will tell you from the five examples I just saw, I think there's phenomenal technology and phenomenal products. And I'd encourage each of those founders to think more about your bigger purpose. And that bigger purpose will not only help you stand for something bigger with your customers and consumers, but also be that tie that binds in your mission, right? Startups get really, really hard. You're in a grind. And why do I wake up to come to work every day? And what really keeps me fighting to achieve my goals? So think about that bigger purpose behind your brands and, and also how it permeates the culture of your company. And then my third lesson is about harnessing the power of the ecosystem. And I really believe it takes a village to incubate the next generation of innovation. And HitLab is a perfect example of the ecosystem at work. And really, as we think about the ecosystem, we think about it broadly in terms of innovation authorities and academic centers that are places for early funding and grants and trials for proof of concept or early adoption, multinational companies that come to the table with funding and resource and know-how and experience to advise startups the broader startup ecosystem, how can we partner more with each other? And you know, one example from my current experience is Nuvo has recently announced a partnership with Baby Scripts, another player in the prenatal care space that has very complementary technology to Nuvo. And how do we come together to offer our customers more comprehensive solutions. So think about co-opetition versus just competition. And of course, the investors that give us fuel to invent, to create, to commercialize. And really the, the ecosystem that works is that exponential fuel. So I'm gonna summarize my three lessons and then pause for questions, comments, reactions. So here are the three takeaways I, I hope to impart to the audience. The first is to field an ambidextrous leadership team. And in that ambidextrous team, think about diverse skill sets and experiences from both multinational companies and the world of startup, because I think there's magic when those different experience sets come together. The second takeaway is craft purpose-driven brands from the outset to drive deeper customer connection and employee commitment as that tie that binds. And then the third is activate the power of the ecosystem for exponential impact. So that, that's what I had to share and I'd love to open up, it up for questions, comments, reactions. Uh, wonderful, Deborah. Thank you very much for uh, sharing us, uh, with, with us your insights. I don't see any, uh, any uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I think you pretty much wowed everybody uh, without, without, without the need for any questions and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for coming in, coming on and sharing that in your, in your keynote. Uh, we're honored to have you on and thank you, you know, really thank you very much for your time to prep and present for us today. My, my pleasure. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, with that being said, the judges are back, everybody. Um, so uh, without further ado, I know we are three minutes behind schedule. 
Um, so I'd like to invite um, Nico Canaris, who is um, the key coordinator or lead coordinator for the Breakthrough Alliance, uh, who has effectively put all of this together and brought everyone um, uh, in terms of uh, panelists, uh, judges, uh, the committee, and uh, all of our participants together. So, uh, Nico, I will um, I will succeed the floor to you. All right. I don't want to keep everyone waiting for much longer, uh, so I might just have to uh, uh, go ahead and just announce who the winners are um, to, of course, uh, cut the suspense for everybody. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, the judges were in. Uh, Quite heated discussions earlier while uh, Deborah was giving her wonderful keynote speech um, and uh, we did come up with actually three uh, three winners in the end to uh, take part in the Breakthrough Alliance and our winners are uh, Cardiomo, Live Metric and Duality. So virtual round of applause for our three innovators uh, who had some wonderful uh, innovations to present today um, and um, we do want to actually give some honorable mentions to Cake and Taylanus, who also gave us some wonderful uh, pre uh, presentations today. And I think everybody uh, who presented today are going to make such a huge impact within the, within the healthcare space. Um, and that's what the Breakthrough Alliance is all about. It's really helping to discover those um, vital um, digital health solutions that are really going to make the best impact and to be able to get them into the hands of the end users as quickly as possible. So congratulations to all of our winners. Well done to everybody who presented today. Thank you again to our esteemed panel of judges uh, who came on to uh, give, uh, give their insights and their questions to the, to the panelists. Um, and uh, thank you again to Deborah Bass from, uh, from Nuvo for giving us a wonderful uh, keynote presentation as well. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming on. Apologies for some of the technical difficulties that we had, um, but uh, I think Stan is, uh, in the next segment, um, interviewing um, Generable uh, on, uh, on oncology um, analysis. So see you all over there. Um, and thank you very much for uh, attending the first Breakthrough Alliance that we've had at the Hit Lab Summit. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>